Good morning. This is Mercy Russell with the Remarkable Relationship Show. My goal is to bring to you a fresh perspective on all things related to how humans develop their individual brilliance while navigating the excitement, stickiness, and resistance in their relationships. In my 40 years of working as a psychotherapist and consultant, I've been continually amazed at the ways in which people overcome challenges. I hope to share my experience and insights so you can find the magic in your relationships. My hope in this show is to answer questions and challenges you are facing in your relationships. There are several ways you can ask me a question. You can send me a question by mail at mercy at leadershipwithmercy.com. This gives you anonymity since I will not share the identity of the listener asking the question. I often disguise the identity of the listener by changing details while addressing the problematic dynamic. My answers will be available during the live show, as well as on the KKNW podcasts and the KKNW YouTube channel. In addition, I post transcripts of the shows on my website, leadershipwithmercy.com. Please don't be shy about asking questions. I recognize that it can take courage to, to call into a radio show, especially about personal matters. I have rarely heard a unique dilemma. Your question will help other people listening to the show. Plus, this allows me to know what interests you. I'm interested in all corners of human behavior and relationships. So I need your help to know how I can address what troubles and intrigues you. Eventually, I hope to have listeners call into the show. I'm excellent on the spot knowledgeable and intuitive. As a listener, I get so much more from a conversation between the host and the caller. So in my show today, my guest is Dr. Daryl Green. Welcome, Dr. Green. Como esta? Ni hao? <laughs> yes. <laughs> good, Doc, good morning. <laughs> good morning. Uh, Dr. Green is the Dickinson Chair of Business Professor, is, a, is the Dickinson Chair of Business Professor at Oklahoma Baptist University in Oklahoma City. After a 27-year career as a mechanical engineer at the Department of Energy, he pivoted to a leadership role in higher education in business management. This morning, we will talk about his career path and his recently and and we'll touch upon his recently re released book, Managing, Mapping Out Your Life After Retirement, 100 Plus Ways to Pursue Your Purpose, which clearly Dr. Green is doing. <laughs> so um, we're going to, you know, what I like to do in starting with, the, with, the, with these interviews is to talk and introduce the audience to you and your background kind of get a place. That's how I think about my you know conversations with people. I do wanna mention that before recording this show, Dr. Green and I have had a lively conversation about a hot topic. And um, <clears throat> in, the, uh, in the world of sports and higher education, and um, uh, I, I want to touch on this later in our conversation. And this will give you a chance to see how Dr. Green and how I might think about very emotional, but important and visible topics that we're so used to in our, in our, um, in our culture today. So <clears throat> Dr. Green, um, Linda, I'd like to start by just asking you a little bit about your background. So could you just tell the audience a little bit about where you grew up, your family? Just let us know who you are, where you come from. I think it really is it's really important in these days. Well, Mercy, I really, again, appreciate you having me. I'm originally from Shreveport, Louisiana. Uh, was uh, raised uh, by two Christian uh uh, uh, individuals, my, my parents, they, my dad was a, 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 a janitor. Uh, my mother was a, uh, my mother was a, uh, chauffeur. Uh, my dad had a third grade education and, uh, but they taught us, uh, that we can do anything with God's help. And so 
graduated from Southern University in Mechanical Engineering, Southern University is in Baton Rouge. I think it's the greatest university in the world. Human <laughs> uh, youth box, uh, the band is powerful. I met my wife there, Estralita. Uh, she uh, she, uh, she uh, graduated in civil engineering. Uh, we were dating at the time, just wanted to, wanted to be together, wanted to, wanted to do management. And we had opportunity and my, and my wife uh, at the time was my girlfriend. They, they took her to Washington State Department of Energy, who by the way, uh, focuses, uh, there's a big focus on nuclear energy or, or nuclear waste. And they flew her 3,000 miles away to Washington State. I told her the only way you're going to go up there is you got to have your man with you. And so she, uh, they called me the next day, said, we'd like to hire you. I said, I can't make that decision. So I talked to Esther Lita. They flew her to my state, uh, made a decision that we were going to go to Washington State. My wife's from Alabama, from Louisiana. All hell broke loose in our families because they could not understand why in the world would you like to go uh, 3,000 miles away from family and friends. Uh, but it was a special place. Uh, spent five years there, got off the plane. Uh, that was before the internet. Uh, there was an encyclopedia that said Washington State was the evergreen state. And I know you talked about spending time in Seattle, uh, but I was in I was in Eastern Washington. It was a desert. Uh, <laughs> right. That was uh, that was 0.9% Americans. It wasn't even one percent. I had to ship grits. I had to ship hair, not, well, ship grits. Did, not yeah, ship ship, ship grits. grits. That's the yeah, expression ship you grits. taught me. Right. You yeah. had to. So for those that are not Southern, it's kind of like a multi meal if you're, you're from the North, Northern we States. But grits and uh, hair products, uh, I didn't need it, but my wife did. And I uh, spent uh, five years there and then transferred to uh, Knoxville, Tennessee, uh, managing nuclear and non-nuclear uh, projects, like you said, 27 years. But I wanted more out of life, went back to school, got my master's degree, went back to school, got my doctor's degree, and, and making short, I made a, a transition. Now, uh, to now just a second, Daryl. I'm going to... Can I switch to Daryl? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Dr. Green, yeah, Daryl. Yeah. Um, yeah. So while you're while you're working as an engineer, you were you were getting going into getting masters and a doctorate, but not in engineering, yeah. but yeah. in leadership, business management. Yeah. So uh, that's a, that's a story. Uh, I, I had a chance to do some engineering back when I was in Washington State, and uh, I'm a people person, as you can tell. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it's just that we were managing. And so it's all about relationships. So your 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 show, it's all about relationships and really to be successful. It's all about building relationships. Uh, I have I have uh, managed and overseen some of the world's smartest people in the world. And some of them, they were butts. They were, they were awful folks. Uh -huh. So it's all about building relationships. And so I was just, I was just, I'm a problem solver. And so uh, I wanted more, uh, I was making good money. Uh, is what we say. The kids say we make a good chatter. But I wanted more out of life, and so I I I, I like solving problems. And so I I thought I was going to go back to school. I th actually thought I went to the University of Tennessee. I uh, talked to them. I thought I was going to be a. I thought I was going to teach. I thought I was going to be a, a middle school teacher teaching math, but they told me I had to quit my job, and I wasn't going to do that because I I have three kids, <laughs> so uh -huh. I quit my job. But I went into uh, management like that. I went back to school, working my doctorate, and it's the, my doctorate is in strategic leadership. So I believe in developing the next stream of leaders that if we improve our decision making, we can improve our life. And so that's what really turns me on, helping people make decisions, improving their life. And that's where the leadership part of that, that, that comes from. So that, right. that answer that question? How yes, I got into that? Yeah. So, so as you were doing this, you were, and you were a, in the position you had in the Department of Energy, mm -hmm this was all material that you could apply because you were in yes. management right yes ex 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 exactly but you know one of the things that got me is that i wanted more impact you know in the federal government you could work you could work 20 30 years and somebody administration changed all the work that you did got changed in one stroke of a pen right and then it takes it takes like maybe it takes 100 years to get things done sometimes and so I wanted, I wanted more, in, uh, more impact. And I did, when I got my master's degree, I did do uh, some adjunct work at uh, Knoxville College, the historical black college uh, in Tennessee, the only uh, East Tennessee uh, historical black college there. Did that, working with underserved students like that. Uh, got another opportunity to, to teach at a different school. And uh, so I was encouraged. So I, I kind of liked that. And, and what was, uh, I guess, a epitome, epitome for me was uh, one of my colleagues that I wrote uh, some scholarly work with, uh, uh, Dr. Gary Roberts mentioned, 
have you ever thought about doing uh, teaching full time? I said, no, because I like consulting. I like solving problems, I like teaching. I like mm -hmm. writing and I can do all those things. And so I uh, got my doctor, doctor degree in 2009, thought God was going to take me away, but he did. not I, I, I was still there. And, and in 2015, I became dedicated. I had applied over uh, maybe 169 jobs. Uh, this is so you did you were applying then for I was uh, I started applying for, for, for academic positions for academic you, positions yeah. in uh in 20 so I applied on 169 got interviewed at Purdue so that made me think hey yeah. I could I could make it I was I was in contention yeah. in other places uh but there was something special about Oklahoma Baptist University for one thing they brought my wife and myself there so that was very attractive. Normally, when you normally we go on oh, visit sure. trips, oh yeah, they only bring they only bring the person that they right. considered. But they brought my wife and gave her a tour. And what? Yeah, got let's me, just let's just. I just want for my audience, you know, you yes. and I, I've I have a degree basically out in higher ed. <laughs> I have a doctorate also. In fact, one of our connections <clears throat> when I looked at your resume is that you had taken a course, a certificate course at the mm. University of Vermont. And I think when I wrote to you, I said, how did you get to Vermont, <laughs> right? Then it turned out, you know, all over the internet, right, online. Yeah. But yeah. at any rate, we had this connection. And mm -hmm. I just, could you just, um, first of all, pardon me, but for our audience, could you just talk a little bit about historical Black colleges? Yeah. And yeah. Uh, even in my awareness from talking to you, I'm a, I, 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 I think there are, there are so many historical black colleges we are you know we aren't aware of there are many colleges all over the country yes. that that students take advantage of mm -hmm. but could you talk a little bit about that and then your um <clears throat> yeah in in your process both with your own education and then applying mm -hmm. for jobs how did you yeah how how did you find yourself oriented to you know the historical black college mm -hmm. uh un universe let's just say okay. so a uh, great great question i'd love to do that uh 4, 000, uh 4, schools across the country currently uh there are about 100 and 100 plus 106 hbc historical black colleges uh how did they come about uh so uh after the emancipation uh, proclamation slaves were uh, set free and there was a big concern what do you do uh it was, i call it the negro problem what do you do with that and a, a lot of the a lot of the uh, uh religious institutions established uh uh the institutions uh for uh black 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 students uh one of them would be famous to be hampton institute uh in virginia another one would be uh uh tuskegee institute I would be another one of those famous areas uh, for state. So in state schools, uh, for the states, uh, they set up land grant not not only for uh, for uh, uh, just uh, uh, predominantly white schools, but land grant schools. That if you think about uh, doing work with your hands, uh, forming uh, the school that I went to, Southern University A and M, used to be uh, one of those schools uh, that were hands on not like liberal arts uh, schools and so that, so they'd that like, is, and so they'd like have departments of agriculture yes right? yes Home economics and, yes which was that's, broader than yes, you know how you said yes, table yes, right yes, yes so they table. were very um yeah they were very oriented to the sort of more well i guess what we call yes. professional these days yes. too really yes. about you know how you're yes. going to apply your knowledge in the world mm -hmm. Yeah, I, that, exactly. I think a a, con, a contrast to that, I would I would go to uh, universe. I would go to Tennessee. Uh, you have uh, Tennessee State University is a land grant college. Uh, again, you have uh, all those things uh, related to uh, building things, so people can work. And then you have contrast right in that same uh, Nashville area. You have Fisk University. Uh, Fisk University is a liberal arts school. Well, the focus will emphasis on uh, building uh, uh, better people. So it's the contrast between W.D. Boys, I want thinkers, uh, as opposed to uh, Booker T. Washington, hey, you need to get a job. And so those schools co coexisted. Faith has always been a center part of that. So, so the question, I'm going to pivot to this. We're in a, uh, some people say a post-Obama uh, world 
why do you need historical black college, black colleges? And so the, the reason why they came about because they were segregated and there was opportunity to grow. So unfortunately, we're still dealing with the, 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 the greatest, one of the greatest sins in America is slavery, is that we still have institutional barriers. I know some people don't believe in that, but there's still, still barriers. And so those school and, and but here's a here's a here's some stats. Uh, uh, historical black colleges even now uh, produce most of the PhDs, black PhDs that come from historical black black colleges. So that is a that is just a fact. So that so there is relevance because there you know you, there are things that you can do. Uh, when I graduated from Southern University, uh, the first thing one of the one of the HR person said, "Well, I don't think you can you can you can make it because you you've been you've been uh, you grew up uh, you got your degree." Uh, from a uh, from a black school that was not reality, but what that what that HR person failed to understand is that those universities are diverse. That I already understand mo uh, most about white 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 and white culture, and so yeah. I was able to navigate because I know if 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 you know we talk about relationships, if I understand what it means to suffer and to be uh, to be marginalized and, and, and ridiculed and 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 not valued, I'm not gonna. So for me. I'm not going to treat when I got in the workforce as an engineer making good money. I was talking to the maids. I was talking to cleaning service, the janitors. I was talking to the security because I understand what it means to be marginalized. I don't want anyone to be disrespected and not bring that into the classroom. So right. for me, I think that is that is that is really an asset. I think understanding understanding that. Yeah, this is a, a you know, I I've thought about this in another way, too. Um, it's, then this gets into a bigger topic, which was, of course, <laughs> during the 60s, we had a big push for integration. Yes. And there's still a huge push in my college, Carleton College in Northfield, you, the admissions director, it's all about bringing more and more people of color and marginalized populations into this kind of highly selective college. And at the same time, the, a, a women's college, you know, a get segregated college, there are still women's colleges. Yes. And, you know, historically black colleges provide an environment that can be very safe for, so in academics, women have been marginalized, right? Yes. They get into a classroom with yes. men and they don't talk and the yes. men talk. Yes. But in, when you're all, when it's all women and all girls, there's more freedom to really explore. And mm. I, I'm, I'm thinking that 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 also that, you know, historically black schools uh, have this now historically black schools, um, you know, are also integrated in that white yes. students can yes. attend, right? Yes. And yes. so you're but yes. so tell us then more about Oklahoma Baptist. Okay, so um, that, you, you got me excited. Let me let me let me people. There, like, if you look at West Virginia, West Virginia has a university there. It's a historical black college. I think it's ninety percent white. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, because because it's the the, dem the demographics change. So the, 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 when, the, when I was applying to college, my mother suggested I apply to Howard. Get out of here. Not Spelman, of course, but because yeah. she didn't really know about Spelman. Yeah. Really, yeah, she knew about Howard, mm -hmm. and she yeah. her her father was an academic, yeah. and she yeah. knew about Howard. Yeah. But she um, and then I have a friend with an African American daughter. Mm -hmm. He's white. He's in Vermont. She was raised in white culture, right. and she didn't want to go to you know. To, she wanted to go to an integrated school. Mm -hmm. I mean, a white school because that's mm -hmm. what she knew, mm -hmm. right? And so there, it gets very complicated mm -hmm. and nuanced in terms it, of each individual mm -hmm. and their experiences mm -hmm. and what they're looking for. But it, all to say, it's. Um, uh, but I think this historically black college um, part of our higher education system is important to know about yeah. and interesting. Yeah. So, so, and most of those schools are still not, you know, so we talk about the politics. A lot of those schools, uh, let's say like uh, Tennessee State, I think they, that, that the Tennessee owes them oh, probably over $100 million. And you can say that for most of the state schools, because again, you got people that don't think they're valuable. And so they underfund, so they, they operate and work more with less. 
So I want to address. Are they private? Uh, Generally, they tend to be private, though. Not. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's but a. They it's could a, be a it's, land grant. It's too. a, it's a, it's a mix. It's a yeah. mix. They're, they're, they're both private and public schools. Uh, uh, for example, uh, in the state of Oklahoma, which we're talking about, uh, there's Langston University, which is a state school. But it's probably the state probably not giving them all the money they should. But so I want to talk about leaving a historical black so one of the things that and, and talk about the women's uh, uh women's uh, universities and, mm -hmm. and minority service institutions is that you have i have so i have confidence i'm, I'm not looking i'm not holding my head down i i, I live with pride because I'm, I'm very assured about my skill set uh so so what happens uh a lot of times what so i think there's a greater opportunity for uh the universities and college, colleges to get underserved communities, uh, uh, women, uh, Native Americans, African Americans, Hispanics, blah, blah, blah. it's an opportunity to do that because here's what happens. I, I, my master's degree is predominantly white school. All my degrees predominantly the white school. I was I never felt like I was a part of the institution. I, I never felt a part of that, and I think so. What what most act administrators come they don't really understand it they don't get it they want to recruit more minorities they see that they see the demographics change in 2044 there's a cliff and mm -hmm. they see that but they do not understand that people want to people want to feel apart that accessibility is not the same thing as being included and that mm -hmm. is where they make mistakes they do things that they and that's why you get into microaggressions and you know, and for me as a professor, I you know, if I if I got if I had to I have to hold my breath every time somebody uh said something to me that was disrespectful and marginalized because of who I am, I would I would probably be dead. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you to talk a little bit about microaggressions because I was in a training this last weekend yeah. with 20 people, therapists, and we yeah. were starting to talk about just, you know, it was a trauma based. So microaggressions. And I have to say the one person, one of the people of color there who is, you know, in his sixties, didn't said he didn't know what microaggressions were. Mm -hmm. Now he did, of course, mm -hmm. but the term was not on the tip of his tongue. So I don't want to assume that people know what you're okay. talking about. So it's, 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 it's subtle slights, uh, subtle slights uh, at somebody. I'll give you an example. Uh, coming uh, straight out of uh, college, uh, I, I wrote a lot. Uh, and so I'm a prolific writer. I was one of the better writers. And I never will forget. So I had a mentor. Most of my mentors were uh, uh, Caucasian. They were white uh, senior guys. And uh, one of my one of my buddies who was an African-American had, a, had a written something, an email. And I was asking my my mentor, you know, it was why I said, uh, I said, uh, you know, how do you, how do you, uh, how do you get one of my friends made an error? How do you, how do, how do you fix it? And he said, uh, don't, don't worry, everyone knows black people can't write. <laughs> he, uh, so he, that was a micro. <laughs> so micro, was, that sounds kind of macro to me. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, he, he didn't, but he didn't. I mean, he, he respected me. I think he cared about me, but he didn't understand. I mean, he's a good old South. He's a good old boy from Arkansas. He didn't understand that. It's just like the little subtle things, slights, uh -huh. like you might be in a classroom and we're talking about, we're talking about uh, uh, slavery and, 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 and somebody say, uh, uh, once you talk about the subject, you, uh, you know, you call out to one black person to talk about it and just things that, uh -huh. that are kind of subtle. But right. you 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 know it you know what they're saying. I mean, mm -hmm. growing up in the South, you we run yeah. across all. So let me let me just that. give another example that I I don't know how many people do this, but I uh, for some reason I mean I I do follow some of the things with the royals right in mm -hmm. England. Yes. And okay, and and uh, there was a, a, one of the ladies in waiting. I think of um, yes. Camilla actually. Mm -hmm no the queen it was either the queen or camilla uh, been in for decades had been in service mm -hmm. and she uh at a gathering mm -hmm. asked there was a you know an african-american not african-american actually 
you know, a, a black British. woman mm -hmm. who is British and mm -hmm. English asked her where she was from. Yes. Assuming that because yes. she wasn't white, she yes. wasn't English. Yes. And she was English and she was yes. British. And yes. she have, she protested and that lady in waiting resigned. Mm -hmm. That was a microaggression. Yeah. Where uh, are you uh, from? Uh, Assuming uh, that you're not from here. Yeah. Uh, students saying, uh, what, where, where did you go to school? you teach it they're saying uh what's uh you know what what's your expertise i mean they don't come out they don't do that they don't do that to me because i'm a big guy and i got credentials yeah. but the, i mean uh, like even females and, and minorities they challenge your your, your credentials your, your ability um uh -huh. and you know it's so yeah. uh but that that's so, so, that's what that's all about so i'm uh, i'm sorry but it's now it's, i can i now i'm not it, quite sure what we were talking about but i do one thing i do want you to talk about and we're going to do this out because we have to take a break okay. and we're going to do this after the break but i really i wanted to i want you to talk about what you're doing in oklahoma Baptist, yes yes and um and some of it, particularly the experiences that your students have had in your kind of innovative um uh well, we call it service learning i think um with your micro internships um, um in the in the oklahoma you know communities I, I think that's been that's really fascinating this is mercy russell with a remarkable relationship show i'm here today with dr daryl green and uh we're talking about his career and uh higher education and um hopefully we'll make it exciting for you We'll be back after the break. Have something important to say? Want to help improve our world? Need to promote your business uniquely and effectively? KKNW is the answer. Our staff helps broadcasters and podcasters create professional sounding audio. Bring your talent and let our experts help you craft a radio show or podcast that best delivers your message. Learn more at 1150kknw.com. That's 1150kknw.com. KKNW, talk variety that's live and local. Make it a great day. Keep your dial on Alternative Talk 1150. Hello, this is Mercy Russell with the Remarkable Relationship Show. I'm here today with my guest, Dr. Daryl Green. Um, we've been talking about his career, uh, historically black colleges, and what I want him to, well, I'm going to ask, what I want to, you to talk about, Daryl, now is exactly what work you're doing uh, mm -hmm. with your students uh, at, um, uh, at Oklahoma Baptist Christian University, mm -hmm. and I'm particularly interested in your your a particular uh project you have with micro internships and how you've affected the community in Oklahoma with that so uh that's that's a great question so uh I'm at Oklahoma Baptist University I'm the Dickinson chair I want you to think about this uh it's a great school I like my colleagues uh in the hundred year history of the business school of the the hundred year history of the school I'm the first Afro American uh business professor is it a historically black college? It's a no. It's a it's it's a historical Southern Baptist. Southern Baptist. Okay. Oh yeah, yeah Southern yeah. Baptist. So okay. it's a Southern Baptist school. Uh huh. Uh, so it's a uh, my my colleagues. I love them. Uh, they they embrace me. They let me be myself. So let's talk. Let's talk about the way I think. I think very different because here's the thing. I came out of industry, so I come out of industry and I'm teaching, which is highly different. Uh, especially 20 or 30 years ago, you're, su you're a suspect because you didn't go all the way through school. I worked through school, which is uncharacteristic of traditional uh, professors. And we talk about breakthroughs. Breakthroughs happens when you come, when you bring different experiences, uh, different expertise into in different industries. That's what I've done. Uh, have an engineering background. Uh, dealing with dealing with nuclear projects, dealing with world class people, I bring that skill set. And what I like about the school that I, I'm in, the business school, they allow me to be myself. And even in uh, even in uh, 
the business world, I was, I was, there was always a ceiling. Oh, we don't want you to do that. You know, it was all, but now I get opportunities. So I teach uh, marketing, leadership, operations, project management. I teach all of those things. And what I try to do is something, uh, you talked about service learning. It's been called service learning. Uh, it's been called, uh, we call it experimental learning. Uh, and so it's it's hands. I give my every class. There's a hands-on component, and I teach very differently. We talk about innovative approaches. Is that ninety percent of the professors they teach uh, they the way that they teach is what we call uh, subject focus. They focus on the subject. They probably give like you got a, a hour class. They're probably giving a fifty minute lecture. The teach the students are taking taking notes supposedly. Uh, but the problem is it doesn't resonate uh, with this generation of students. And I, I'll be honest with you, it didn't generate generate with me. I'm generation, I'm generation <laughs> X. I didn't like that. Yeah, it the didn't really was, resonate with me either. Yeah, yeah. Festivals, yeah. festivals were boring. Yeah. yeah. And it what I didn't understand how how is that relevant to me? <laughs> but I think that's the way I, I so I teach uh really uh student-centered learning. I had to understand about generation uh generation Z. Uh, that is the current generation born 1995 1996 afterwards it's called uh, they're, they're generation what excuse me it's called it's generation a, uh, they're called generation uh, uh generation z z as opposed right. as opposed to generation y which y. are millennials uh they're also called nexers uh but they've never known a, a world without uh smartphones and social media their right. life is an open book and so in the classroom we tell them don't use your technology uh I've got sit sit through and one of the characteristics uh as been said maybe laughing is that they have attention spans of eight seconds but the thing is you're doing a 50 minute boring lecture that has no relevance for the students they're playing on their phones they're goofing off they're not paying attention to you and what did you do you what do you do for an assignment you give them a quiz and an exam and it really does not speak into that and so what I have tried to do is uh I, I I make it relevant. I, I do career, I make them career ready, and and we talk about how to be professional professionalism. Uh, we give feedback, and what one of the things we talked about the micro internship. The micro internship. When we talk about in, uh, traditional internship. Traditionally, uh, you're working with you working with an employer. A lot of times it's in the summertime, and uh, and but but the micro internship uh, came out of the I'd say came out of the COVID. Uh, so students were forced to work remote, and so uh, companies like Parker Dewey uh, started uh, making uh, assignments, working with companies to allow the students to work remote. So the characteristics of a micro internship is primarily is working remotely, and it's it's project specific. Uh, a lot of times in internships, students don't know what they're doing; they're filing mm -hmm. papers and doing some other stuff, but it's very focused. And uh, so that's what I've been focusing on. I've been actually been doing research. I'm gonna come up with some research uh, uh, soon on that. Uh, but I, I think, I think between, again, uh, traditionally, I've always tried to work with my business partners because uh, they they help prepare the students. Uh, so uh, in my history as teaching since 2005, uh, private students have helped, helped over 100 100 companies, and I probably probably put in. Th uh, 3,000 consulting hours. And the students do it free because they're getting experience, especially uh, dealing with COVID. The, the employers get fresh ideas. They get people that, that are digital natives. They understand the landscape. And it's I think it's a win-win situation. I think that's I think that's the wave of the future. Most of the schools, you know, like a school like University of Oklahoma or, or LSU or uh, University of Tennessee or Florida, these huge schools with 100 students, 200 students in the classroom, they do not have time. And here's the thing about, I think about what sets Oklahoma about the university apart is that we're hands-on. I know my students by name. I can get on them. I say, you need to get, you need to do better. I have a personal relationship. Mm -hmm. That was makes it very attractive because it's all now about how, relationships. How big is how how big is Oklahoma Baptist? Uh, uh, so in the, in, in the heyday, we had over two thousand students. I think we're a little less than that with uh, dealing with 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 COVID. Yeah. Uh, my my average classroom was about 14, 14 students, fifteen students. Fourteen students. Wow. Yeah, which is and, which is real nice. And most of your students come from your re from the region. I would Oklahoma. say I would say a large part of the students again, uh, as we know about the pandemic. 
uh, most of the students have, have chosen to stay closer to, to home in the, within the state, mm -hmm. but we, we do have a lot of students coming from Texas. It's, it's a, it's a, uh -huh. a, it's a border state. Yeah. Uh, and I would say also Missouri and Arkansas, but primarily would be uh, Oklahoma, Oklahoma and okay. Texas. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, so back to your micro internships. Yeah. So, so it's a, it's a great experience. I've, I've seen, I've seen it since success. And here's what, here's what we do. I think is different. Uh, the micro interns are embedded in my, embedded in the classroom. What makes that different is because a lot of times we make a lot of assumptions. We make assumptions that they're, did, they're digital natives, uh, they're young, and a lot of times companies say, well, you're the youngest one on the staff, we're going to put you over social media, and they don't know what they're doing. They don't, they don't mm -hmm. know everything. Mm -hmm. And it's other, it's the other thing that in the classroom, I'm able to talk about professionalism. I'm able to, I'm, I'm over a span of 10 weeks. I, I really don't want to send a student out, i am be honest with you, that don't have, that is not prepared. I don't just want to send them because they don't know how to dress. They make certain assumptions that they, you know, that they, that they can wear shorts, that they can wear a hat in the class, they, they can wear a hat in, in a business, that they can dr uh, dress up and they can come to an interview dressed very poorly in warm-ups. Mm -hmm. No, you know, that has been caused because we don't have the same kind of training in the home. Uh, right. They don't go to churches or synagogues. They don't do that anymore, a, a, a mosque. And so they don't have that rigor. And so for me, uh, I have transformed, I think maybe 50, 50, I do my lectures about 15 minutes. They say, oh, Dr. Green, that should be longer. That should be, it's because you know what, you're saying you want a 50, you want a 50 minute lecture. You're not even paying attention. Right. It's because what I, what I've transformed innovative teaching, because now I've shifted from just not teaching. I am coaching and mentoring my students each okay. week. I, that yeah. is very important. I say, you know what, that is improper. This is the way you need to write that e even send an email out to a potential employer. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm, I'm glad you're going to be partnering with us. But a lot of times students would say, hey, hey, hello, <laughs> or not even address the person. Uh -huh. I say, look, you know, and, and then maybe when you're trying to, to Dr. Green, I was trying to meet, I was trying to meet up with my client. I can't get in contact with them because they'll text them or they'll or they'll send they'll call them on the phone and they'll hang the phone off they don't answer it answer it they don't leave a message and yeah. so i had so that situation is... i had that situation happen in, in class and here's i'm an old school professor so i had we i think it was like maybe 15 students in the class a couple students complaining dr green we have been unable to reach our client our client i say really i said well hold on let me get my phone i say uh bill uh they've been trying to reach you and I gave them the phone. They were so embarrassed. Uh huh. Uh huh. <laughs> but it so, demonstrate it demonstrated right. that these that are some, basic. These are basic work. Yes. Yeah, work skills. Right. Yeah, that it, college students don't have. Yeah, and I'm, and I'm saying right. these 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 some of the students of, of some of the elite students. I'm just saying we just take as 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 educators, we're taking those things for granted, and we're leaving the students in a bad situation right. because they don't have some of the basic social skills. That's going to make up. It's all of our relationships. Right. So speaking of that, Dr. Green, I want you to talk about you. You've done your micro internships, which I've looked at, are global, right? And students have worked in all kinds of different industries. Um, however, you talked to me about ha having students about these towns in Oklahoma that were you might call a historically black town yes, yes and having your students help people in those these towns are kind of in a way dying you know they're yes. languishing could you talk a little bit about those towns number one yes. and then number two and then how that affected your students okay great a great question so one of the things i think my skill is i try to leverage unmet needs and uh we talk about not just uh, uh historical black towns but rural towns rural areas uh, under uh, underserved, and so just a brief history lesson because you like I was very ignorant. I'll be honest with you, I was very ignorant about uh, Native Americans. I was very ignorant about Oklahoma historical black towns. Uh, so a little bit of history. Uh, you had Andrew Jackson. I don't in the I don't know early eighteen hundreds, nineteen hundreds. I'm not I'm not sure on that. Uh, but they decided he just present said, you know what, we need to get these folks out of here and we need to put them in one place. He was talking about Native Americans, and so he uh, he did the I think one of the one of the biggest uh, migrations in the in the in the country. 
uh, uh, Native Native Americans or Indians uh, that were in the uh, Northeast, the, the 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 South areas that may, may migrated them uh, to uh, Oklahoma and other areas. Well, they called that the Trail of Tears, and they they brought them on, and so they came along. And what I did not know that some of those some of those uh, Native Americans had slaves. So when once they came, they migrated. And believe it or not. Uh, Native Americans have a lot they of They had African gifts. American slaves. Yeah, Af yeah, uh, yeah. Well, or Africans. Yeah, let's call them yeah. blacks. They could call them we'll blacks. Call them slaves. blacks, right? Yeah, they weren't they, like yeah. Native. Yeah, they were African. They were, they, were, they, were, right? they, were Af they were African slaves. Okay, I think. They were we, I think we consider they were African yeah. slaves, and so they brought them in there. They migrated. Uh, so uh, that is, and, and so when the uh, they started setting the, uh, the slaves free, uh, the Native Americans did that. Some of the some of the natives some of the natives. Uh, actually, uh, in uh, intermingled uh, with mm -hmm. the uh, uh, Africans, intermarried, so, yeah, intermarried. Uh, so you got freemen. So some of them do. Some of those uh, blacks actually have. Uh, they're trying to get their cards uh, be legitimized, and that's a big fight right now. Uh, but there were there were uh, initially there were there were about fifty town black towns uh, that came that came across. Uh, and believe it or not. Uh, one of the one of the towns, uh, I believe, it was Guthrie. Uh, at one time, was was Oklahoma was a, was the cap a black town was the capital of Oklahoma. People don't want to know that, but th that happened. That migrated, wow. and so one of the things when you hear about uh, you hear about the black towns, one of the things that come up right now is the Tulsa. They say the Tulsa riots. It really wasn't a riot. They say Tulsa massacre. Don't want to go into that, uh, but there was a so, there was a. a Green, uh, Greenwood was the community where that kind of happened, uh, but that's where it got got it got its name. And so one of the things I, I saw, I know those those areas were underserved. Uh, they had some church members. I uh, a member of St. John Missionary Baptist Church, where uh, Pastor uh, Jemison uh, is is ahead. Uh, some of the members were working with the towns, uh, uh, Jesslyn Head and and Andre Head, and I was and they asked me, I was at helping them, and so I got a chance to uh, understand the towns. Uh, each other towns have their own distinction. You have Bowley. Bowley is known for the Black Rodeo. There's a Black Rodeo that uh -huh. takes place. When I first got into uh, Oklahoma Baptist University, I went to Rennettsville because they had the Blues Festival in the middle of nowhere. I uh, went there. Uh, there's a place called Grayson. They're known, they're known for uh, the Gumbo Festival. And then you have Langston, uh, Langston, uh, Langston Oklahoma, where Langston uh, University is, is a historical black college. So that's how I got involved in it. I got my students, I had my graduate students working with the towns. Uh, matter of fact, we did uh, some research uh, on the, uh, looking at uh, Oklahoma black towns and looking at economic development uh, through marketing strategies. So I think, it's, I think it's historical because you might have uh, some historicans looking at uh, the Oklahoma black towns, but to my knowledge, there was no one looking at it from the standpoint of business, economic development, or uh, uh, or marketing, so I think my students have, have have produced some historical stuff, and I also had my students doing project management, working working with the towns, uh, putting together uh, documentation on project management, working with the the Coltrane group. Uh, 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 they're the ones that kind of over, uh, over was over working with mm -hmm. the uh, historical black towns. So that that is how I got into it because I had church members that were right. dedicated. Uh, to help in those towns. Yeah. So just by getting exposing your students at a Baptist mm -hmm. university, coming from all different kinds of backgrounds, you know, either more aware or less aware, you were on a learning curve and you brought yes. them along with you to turn, sort yes. of learn about the history, the particularities, the yeah. So that's really interesting. So we so, have a, we have about 10 minutes left. Okay. Oh well, okay. Well, one of the things I want to hit on is uh we talk about diversity uh -huh. and conclusion. I think a lot of people talk about diversity. My thing is, my my students see, I bring a diverse group of people. My in my class, I think I can stand up and say out of ninety percent of the the, the the professors, my students take field trips, and I'm not embarrassed. Like kindergarten, like the, they take field trips to understand. I think that's important to build those relationships within the community to show because in the black community, real relationship, you know. And it makes sense when we build those relationships by not just showing up one time, maybe for Martin Luther King, a Black History Month event, but that we build these relationships. And that's one of, one of the things I like about the micro internship. I'm proud to say a lot of the micro internships, uh, students get aware they're dealing with people that's very different than them. 
And yeah. so I learned they learn respect. Not not by but not by, by me saying you need to be respectful, you need to be kind, but that if they're gonna be professional, they're gonna be working with teams all across the world. And we've had yeah. teams work uh with students, uh with, with work with companies in uh South uh South America, South Africa. Uh, recently uh, uh last semester picked up a a, a client in Albania. So mm -hmm. uh right. So so, so there's cross-cultural at all. And then tell me just, just briefly, I, then I, I do want to go quickly to another hot topic, Oof. but, um, but what's the, what's the racial, uh, you know, profile of your classes, would you say? Ah, uh, it's probably 90% white. I mean, it's a, uh -huh. it's a Southern, it's a Southern, it's Southern Baptist school and it's, and Baptist, you're trying yes. to do better. So here's the reason why you get uh, diversity uh out of most universities is not because of the academic prowess that the universities want more diversity it's the athletic department the athletic oh. department bringing more football players bringing more basketball players track uh soccer that is what gets and that's what to me that's what's most disappointing when you talk about diversity right across across it's through the it's through the athletic department it's not through the academic Good which academic. which we are supposed to be oh. uh, uh shepherding Okay, so that's going to segue us. Before we started, this was not on our agenda, but we just, you know, before we started, we were, uh, Dr. Green was telling me about a, a very interesting situation that's going on in Florida it, around athletics and higher ed. And um, yeah, so I just, and we had, we started having a really good conversation about it. And I just, I, I'd like to talk about it a little bit. We have about, a little less than 10 minutes left okay. in our show can, today. Can, can you bring me back so we can do a B part of this? We could. Okay. So it, just to, uh, just just to, to introduce it. And then yeah, we, can, we can talk stuff. about it more fully in terms of yes. intervention. So <laughs> just, yeah, just a, just a quick uh, uh, snapshot. Yeah. Uh, everyone knows Deion Sanders. They call him Coach Prime. He uh, went to Jackson State University uh, after the uh, George Floyd situation. Helped the university out. It was underserved. Uh, did a great job. Uh, did did amazing job with the institution. Uh, left there and went to uh, University of Colorado. Uh, but but did a great job highlighting the uh, the the uh, uh, the problems uh, solutions uh, at, at 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 historical black colleges. And he his to, and his background, just to emphasize it, was he's, he's, he's a Hall of Famer. Hall of Famer. Uh, he's one of the greatest athletes. Considered to be one of the greatest athletes in the in in the world. He uh, got uh, two or three champion uh, champion Super Bowl rings, and uh, he also played. He was a dual athlete. He played. Uh, he played with the. He played baseball at the national pro level, and he played football. So that's just. Yeah. A, that's, and that's then he sa he segued into coaching in he, higher ed. Yes, he segued and... into. It. And, and and navigated that world yeah so, sort of so gracefully thing, let's just so, say gracefully yeah gracefully but here's the thing about this uh it was a win-win situation he had no he had no uh head coach experience and a lot of times you got to start as a, a a graduate assistant and work your way up and uh, he was able to shortchange the system jackson state needed the coach and so he's a, jackson state is in uh mississippi it's a historical black college and they were able he was able to jump start to demonstrate he could do that uh matter of fact he uh he was able to uh uh he needed to get his i guess get his bachelor's degree he went to a historical black college to get that and so he highlighted that if you give a black college's resources they can do a they can do a great job and they had already did a great job he just was perfect person to segue to that so in leading that a uh, current situation right now uh ed reed uh ed reed is uh a louisiana native i want to bring it up but he is also a hall of famer in the nfl he is uh thought to be one of the greatest uh greatest uh uh, uh defensive backs in the in the world with Deion sanders okay and uh, they were also teammates so uh he had no he had uh he uh he graduated from the university of uh, my uh, university of miami he also uh he also uh, done, done some work there in the pros. He's retired. And he had uh, uh, Bethune Cookman, which is a historical black college in Dayton Beach. Uh, Bethune Cookman is a, a historical uh, educator. Uh, they made an agreement to uh, to work together in principle. And what happened? 
social media, uh, every who's very powerful, very passionate, got on the social media and started blasting the administration. Uh, there were problems in historical black. He pointed out some problems that was going on and highlighted those, and he just blasted the institution. Mm -hmm. And eventually, people pointed out, you know, man, you're 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 you're, you're father and son lit it with with profanity. So you can't act like that. It's a uh, 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 Bethune Cookman is a, is a uh, uh, Methodist uh, University Christian school. You can't do that. He uh, cited apology, but then he went back on and and and, and lit him up again. I'm sorry, lit him up in, in terms of uh, going on social media platforms and started started right. again. And it segued into the administration was left with a situation uh, where they hadn't signed a contract yet. This is all he's just going on campus informally. No, nope, it's just a, a gentleman's agreement that we're going to get you. And so the, the administrator decided, the president decided, uh, we're going to go on a different a different way. Uh, we're not going to hire you. And and as they as the as the proverbial word that all hell broke loose uh, in, across the country right now, everyone's chiming in uh, on right. both sides. Uh, they say, well, some people saying, well, he was passionate. What he said was wrong. He was unprofessional. Uh, that's that's that, that's the people that support him. The other people saying, like uh, at the institution, are saying uh, we got sponsors like Disney. That is not the brand we want to want to serve. We're a Christian institution that doesn't serve. And and so it's a and so right now, uh, the the students, you no know, students are protesting on campus. The, uh -huh. the uh the, everyone has a side it's it's hot it's hot topic across uh platforms uh ESPN's talking about it uh the uh, Fox Fox Sports talking about it yeah yep, the, the barber shops talking about it it's a hot issue on so many levels uh -huh. and so that's where we're at okay well you know I do think we need another <laughs> yes. we need another session to yes. dive into this what I want to highlight for our audience is that um, this these are issues that exist at um, any right. university. Uh, yes, number uh, exactly. one, the sports and athletic component and the financing of universities. At Ohio State University, has the largest English department in the world, and I'm sure other things has a. a a library like nobody has ever seen. And my friend who's a professor there was sort of very, you know, you know, academics are often kind of, you know, <laughs> skeptical about all the emphasis that's put on athletics. And then she said the football team built that library. Yeah. So these are these are issues that are just intertwined in higher education. You cannot separate them um because they not only do the football games but the ad but but alumni who are fans you know contribute to the university because they want a team i have a niece when she was choosing college bright girl fantastic candidate anywhere she was looking for a university because she knew she wanted to be a lifelong fan and she found a university where she could, wherever she was living, she could be a buff. She it went was... to the University of Colorado. Okay. So all to say, I want to say these dynamics are not particular to this particular university. No. Agreed. But yes. what you do have is you have these star athletes who are taking on, and the issues that exist are not particular to that university. Every university has their can of worms. Yes. There's no question about it. Yes. But what you've got is you've got a star who's coming in and who's calling it out and then yes. the role of social media and then all the players that are around you've got disney you've got the students you got the parents you've got the <laughs> alumni and there's the administration trying to hold the line and you know anyway it's, uh it's, 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 we call it a big it's a big mess it's a big mess <laughs> anyway big mess. M -E -S -S, big mess it's a big mess <laughs> Say that again. A big miss, like a miss. M e s s. Oh, big mess. Oh, yeah. yeah you're that's southern. That's my southern it is a big, big mess. mess. Yes. Yeah, but it's good. It's very in instructive. And one of the things I start going at is, well, you know, is is there something that could be done? Is there something to kind of pull this together? And th with that, we're going to have to stop our show, and Daryl and I are going to have to come back because, you know, he is. 
going to be the expert in answering this question. <laughs> so I'm going to give you some time to think about it. Okay. So Daryl, it's been so great to have you on the show today. Yes. So fun. This is Mercy Russell with the Remarkable Relationship Show. And um, if you have any questions or comments, please write me at mercy at leadershipwithmercy.com. If you want to communicate with Dr. Green, you can email him at, tell uh, us your email address. Uh, Daryl.green at okbu.edu. Okbu.edu. We'll put it in the show notes. Thank you so much, and uh, we'll be back soon. <laughs>